Hello and welcome into another episode of Locked on Wolves. Today on the show, we're going to talk about Western Conference win total predictions from ESPN, where the Timberwolves are there, my thoughts on that, how the West lays out. Plus, we'll get into the Western Conference and a conversation with Matt George from Locked on Kings. We're going to talk all about the Western Conference. We're going to talk about Wolves Kings. The Wolves play the Kings home opener in mid-October. So lots to get to in the conversation with Matt as well. It's all upcoming. Welcome in. You are Locked on Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves, your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. Today's episode is brought to us by our friends at FanDuel. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Happy Friday, everybody. Happy weekend. Hope you had a fantastic week. Today, we've got uh, several things to get to. I had a long conversation with Matt George of Lockdown Kings. I actually went on Lockdown Kings to talk about Jordan McLaughlin. So head over to Lockdown Kings to, to listen to our conversation in full. Uh, of course, McLaughlin signing with the Kings over the uh, over the summer. So he was asking me some questions about J-Mac, and I was happy to discuss Jordan McLaughlin, a, a favorite topic of many uh, Timberwolves followers, I believe. So we have a, a long conversation about him. And, and then here on the show today is the rest of our conversation, which is Wolves, Kings, that matchup, and um, uh, you know, which is intriguing. Certainly we get into that. And then also the Western conference um, as a whole, the really kind of the, the landscape of the West. That's actually where I want to start the show. I want to give my take on ESPN's take on potential win totals this season in the West. So we'll do that first. And then I'll get to my conversation with Matt after that. A big thank you off the top for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. All right, so over at ESPN, they do this uh, NBA win prediction thing, and, and the... Um, methodology it's it's not the kevin pelton one which i think we get a little bit closer to the season of course pelton is the ana- analytically minded uh analyst over at espn if you will and he uses his um his uh i'm blanking on the name of his actual projection model that he uses but he he spits out you know wind projections with something of a of an actual scientific method these are Apparently a crowdsourced, like I talked the other day about the predictions that were voted on by 30 writers, analysts, et cetera, at ESPN. This doesn't even say that. It just says team by team. Here's how our expert panel sees it breaking down in the West. So this is ESPN experts talking about how they see the West breaking down. So I want to talk about what they had here. They have OKC number one with 57 wins. And remember, OKC's win total over under on FanDuel is 56 and a half. So a slight over. The Timberwolves are second with 54 wins, 54 and 28. Remember, the Wolves' win total on FanDuel is 52 and a half, so a, a somewhat significant over, one and a half wins over. They have Dallas and Denver tied for the next two spots with 52 wins, so two wins behind the Wolves. The Wolves, three wins behind OKC. Phoenix, fifth with 49 wins, and the Kings, sixth with 47 wins. They have these termed as the contenders. This is the article has them as the contenders, even though the Kings at six are only one win ahead of the Pelicans at seven. I guess they just separated out the play in. So the top six again, OKC three wins ahead of Minnesota, Minnesota, two wins ahead of Dallas and Denver who are tied. Those teams are three wins ahead of Phoenix, who is two wins ahead of the Kings at six. Uh, the only thing they say about the Wolves in this little write up next to it is the Wolves and rising star Anthony Edwards will look to build off the run of the conference finals. Um, so uh, let me do the rest of the West real quick. The play in, they've got the Pelicans, Warriors, uh, Pelicans at 46 wins, the Warriors at 45. Nine and 10 is Memphis and Houston tied at 44. Bottom five, they've got the Lakers also at 44 wins, the Clippers at 43, the Spurs at 35, then a gap to the Jazz at 26, and then a, a smaller gap to the Trailblazers at 15. Uh, excuse me, at 22 wins in the 15th spot. 
Here's my take. Let me actually start at the bottom, and we'll get to Minnesota. Yes, Portland's the worst team in the West. It shouldn't be close. The Jazz are the second worst team, and there should be a big gap between them and the Spurs. I actually think the gap between the Blazers and Jazz may be more. It's hard to predict that somebody's below 20 wins, but the Blazers may legit win less than 20 games. It may be like, uh, what, 2009, 2008, Tim Rules vibes. Like That may be where we're at. So Blazers are last, Jazz second to last, I buy that. I also buy the Spurs at 13, although I had said this the other day on the show, I could see them vying for a playing spot. I think the Spurs are closer to the Clippers than they are to the Jazz and Blazers. And Spurs, Clippers, Lakers, I think, are going to be jumbled together fighting for their play in lives. I, I do think one of those three makes it ahead of Houston. And Memphis, to me, this 44 win and nine seed that they've got them at here in these projections, that feels like we're splitting the difference. I think it's probably likely they're better than 44 wins, but it's also conceivable they're really bad again. Something happens with John Morant, injuries, maybe Edie's not what they think he can be right away. Like there's there's things that can happen here um, where they're where you know they're they're worse than 44 wins. I again I think they're probably more like a 46, 47 win team, but we'll see. Pelicans at seven, kind of the same thing with Zion, right? If Zion's healthy, he played 70 games last year. Um, could they push 50 wins? The Warriors at eight. Like the West is so crazy. The, the contenders tier here, Minnesota at number two at 54 wins. That's about right. When I was pressed last week on the Lockdown Fantasy Basketball show with Josh Lloyd, I think that posted exactly a week ago, if you missed it, over on the Lockdown Fantasy Basketball feed, he pushed me to, to put a number on the Timberwolves. I said I would take the over on 52 and a half without blinking twice. And I've also said, I think I said this on the Basketball Party show on Wednesday on the Lockdown Wolves feed, that I thought they they there's a real shot they could win 60 games. Like that's on the table. It's not insane at all. They won 56 last year. And there's a chance they're better, right? Like the ceiling may be higher with Dillingham off the bench, with uh, you know, a cat not missing five weeks, hopefully, with Ant a year older. They might win 60 games. I said 55. That was my number that I picked. They won 56 last year. The over under is 52 and a half. And ESPN has them pegged here. This panel of experts has them at 54 wins, three behind OKC. I actually would probably rank these teams in the exact same way, as the, at least at, as the top five. I'd go OKC, Minnesota, Dallas, and Denver. You could go either way. I'd probably put Denver ahead of Dallas, even though they had a, a less than a stellar offseason Denver did. But I just think that what they've done for the last three years is more replicable than what Dallas did at the end of last season. Um, and I know Luka is... He's great. They have Clay Thompson, but they lost some dudes too. And I think Denver's got better coaching, marginally so maybe, but I, I think better coaching. I think that uh, Jokic is the best player in the world still. So I, I would put Denver slightly ahead of Dallas at three, Dallas at four. I actually, I don't mind Phoenix at five. That seems right to me. I'd probably put the Pelicans at six ahead of the Kings. And I would say even Golden State and Memphis have a shot at being ahead of the Kings as well. So, um, which speaking of the Kings, lots to get to with the Kings here in just a minute. So all that to say, like, we'll do a, a lot more on this. This is, I just wanted to talk about this because it's out on, it came out on ESPN on, on Thursday. Um, and it's, it's always fun off season fodder. I will give official predictions. If you're, if you're familiar with the show, I I'll do it, you know, right before the actual season, we'll do some more prediction type stuff as we get into September before actual games start. But I will give like a full win total thing. I'll do some predictions and I'll be accountable to those too. I always do a show later in the year where we talk about like where I missed, where I was right. And I think last year, what did I say for the wolves? I think I said 52 wins. I was more optimistic than a lot of people and they won 56. Um, this year I have them at 55 as of right now. And I reserve the right to change that before the start of the season. But sitting here right now, two thirds of the way through August, I have them as a 55 win team pushing for the one seed in the West, because I think for the Thunder to win 57 games, that's tough. I think the 56 and a half over runners, a good mark for them. I would not take the over taking the over on anybody in the West feels dicey. Even though I said I would do it without blinking twice with the wolves. Um, the West is just going to be so compact. I think that's very likely. And actually that's a pretty good segue. Matt and I talk about that. I'll set up the conversation with Matt here in a minute, and then we'll roll right into that here for the rest of the show today. So Matt George from lockdown Kings, He's coming up next on the show. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our title sponsors over at FanDuel. 
You've heard me talk a lot about FanDuel here at Lockdown Wolves. It's America's number one sportsbook. Well, we have something a little different for you right now from FanDuel. Now through September 22nd, so just about a month away, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday Ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. We're headed into NFL season. Preseason is wrapping up this weekend, and uh, there's like a week break. The first game is less than two weeks away, two weeks from yesterday, two weeks from Thursday. Uh, we're, we're It's football season. With a YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out of market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment you can cancel anytime. Again, now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet five bucks, get a three week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. And then with that base plan, you can watch every single Sunday out of market game. Sunday afternoon, out of market game. Just visit fanduel.com slash locked on to download America's number one sports book. Big thank you once again for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen of the day. Of course, for your second listen, you can check out the Lockdown NBA podcast. There's no offseason in the NBA, and Lockdown NBA provides daily basketball analysis from national and local experts. In 30 minutes or less, no one keeps you as informed and entertained as Locked On NBA. Available on YouTube or wherever you get podcasts. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right. Let's go ahead and launch into my conversation with Matt George of Locked On Kings. To set it up quickly, he asked me on to talk about Jordan McLaughlin. Please go listen to that episode. It was a ton of fun. I spent probably 15 minutes just uh, waxing eloquent about J-Mac and his four, five seasons, I think, in Minnesota. Um, so that's a fun conversation. Not looking forward to having to face him in the Kings this year. Uh, but then we get into some talk about the Western Conference as a whole, and specifically the Wolves-Kings matchup. Game two of the season for the Wolves. They start, of course, on that Tuesday after the Celtics ring ceremony games. Game two of the national doubleheader. The Wolves are in L.A. to take on the Lakers. That Thursday, they go to Sacramento for the Kings season and home opener, the Wolves' second game of the season. Could be a bit of a trap game if they win Tuesday night in L.A., or maybe it's a bounce-back game if Ant doesn't have a great night on national TV. We talk about that, too. So we talk about the matchup. We kind of talk a little about the three games against Kings Wolves last year that were all unique in their own way. Uh, the Kings won the season series two games to one. There were some injury things. There were some personal issues that caused Ant to miss half of a game. There were um, all three were good. One was an overtime game. One was an in-season tournament game. So lots to talk about. Matt and I get right into that. We're going to jump right into that part of the conversation. Then we talk about the West toward the end. Um, and again, if you want to hear the McLaughlin portion, head on over to Lockdown Kings. So without further ado, my conversation with Matt George of Locked on Kings. Two years ago, two seasons ago, the Timberwolves had the Kings number. Like for some reason, the Timberwolves were just a team that Sacramento could not figure out. Last season, in the three games the Kings and Timberwolves played, all three of them, if I remember correctly, really good games. Kings yep. ended up winning two out of the three of them. One of them was in overtime. I think the Kings actually handed the Timberwolves their first home loss of the season yep. last season. season. Tournament game. Yeah, and which, so these, I mean, these are two teams that... Even a Sacramento homer like myself can look at it and go, yeah, one team is where the other's trying to be. And that's mm -hmm. that's the Timberwolves. Like we we look at the Western Conference and we can transition this into a conversation about the West period because both of our teams having to deal with this. But to me, there's there's three tiers in the Western Conference. There's there's the bottom tier, which is essentially Portland. <laughs> there's a huge block of teams that the yeah. Sacramento Kings, I think, find themselves in. And then there's a top four, in my opinion. The T-Wolves are, are one of those four. So their expectations are high in Minnesota, but for me, this season is all about Sacramento. One, of course, getting back to the playoffs, but two, proving that especially at home, which of course the opener against the T-Wolves is in Sacramento, especially at home, the Kings can and really should beat any Western Conference opponent if they want to be as good as they claim to be and think that they can be, especially with the addition of DeMar DeRozan. So I actually think that the season opener for Sacramento against Minnesota is a really, really good test for the Kings right out the gate to see how good that they are. How are you viewing from the Minnesota Timberwolves perspective? Again, I know it's the game two, not game one, but starting the season against the Lakers and then the Sacramento T Kings, two teams in that middle of the pack Western Conference tier. How are you looking at both of those matchups and specifically the Sacramento one? Yeah, I mean, it's a tough matchup. I mean, you mentioned two years ago the Wolves played well against the Kings, and I actually didn't love the matchup against the Kings last year, even before that first game. I, I It was something about, I mean, just with how good the Kings are offensively and how fast they can play, that, you know, the Wolves want to slow the game down in general. Mm -hmm. They're a really good half-court, 
that really good underselling it. They're a fantastic half court defensive team. And offensively, sometimes that's what what messes with the Wolves is they play too slow. And if they played faster offensively, um, it, it's a bit of a, a, a chicken or not chicken or the egg. It's, it's a dichotomy, a tough dichotomy because they're better defensively when they play slow, but offensively they need those easy buckets in transition. So the Kings present an interesting challenge because of really because of De'Aaron Fox and also Malik Monk. Um, and so that matchup to me, I said it from the beginning of last year, there were a couple of matchups in the West that worried me and um, the Kings were one of them. And the Kings and the Suns, actually, ironically, because obviously the Wolves swept the Suns in the first round of the playoffs. But um, at the start of the year, it was the Kings and the Suns. And I was like, I don't know that I want to play those guys in the playoffs. It's just something about the way the Kings play and the way as good as the Timberwolves are defensively. Um, Darren Fox is such represents such a unique challenge on the ball where he's he's almost too small for Jane McDaniels to stay in front of consistently and too quick. And, you know, it's it's the right combination of skills that make him hard for anybody to guard. But um, you know, J- Jane McDaniels guarding a, a standard run of the mill star side, you know, star guard or wing. That's a normal size. Jane McDaniels, Anthony Edwards are going to shut them down, but De'Aaron mm-hmm. Fox plus Malik Monk makes it really challenging. Um, and last year, I think it was the first game. Darren Fox had like 36 and 12, um, in season tournament game. The second game, there was like no cat and there was also no Malik Monk. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think Sacramento on a back-to-back is what I had down and, and Ant had a big game. The Wolves won. And then the last game, it was no Fox. Ant left with uh, personal issues mm-hmm. mid game and the Kings won overtime. So all three games were good. All three games were kind of weird in terms of who was available and how it played out. Um, so I don't really know what to expect from this matchup. Um, certainly at LA at Sacramento is a tough way to start the year for Minnesota. Um, and, and they will be favored in both games. I'm pretty confident of that, but sure. winning both is going to be difficult. I, th- I think a split is, is honestly not a terrible outcome when you look at, at also it being Sacramento's home opener too. And, and the emotion that comes with that. I think the game should be looked at as a coin flip. And I don't yeah. mean that with any kind of uh, cockiness or or, or sure. anything of that. I just genuinely, when I see these two teams match up, like you could tell me a bunch of different scenarios happen. I believe you, you could tell me Anthony Edwards w- went supernova and there's nothing the Kings could do to stop him. And Anthony Edwards has actually said that the golden one center is one of his favorite arenas to play in, which Kings fans have taken a run with. Like we have a chance at hell to get Anthony <laughs> Edwards in Sacramento at some point in time. What I view that as is, Oh, Ant likes to come in and drop buckets in Sacramento. So you have to always expect that's a thing. Now, I imagine the Sacramento Kings are going to try and put Keegan Murray on Ant Edwards to try and limit him as much as possible, if that's even possible at this point. He just continues to get better and better and better. In fact, like I think at this point, I think the torch has been passed. I think Ant Edwards is the face of the league. I don't care how many MVPs uh, Jokic is winning, Joel Embiid, but whatever. Like I think Ant Edwards is the face of the league. And any chance, even if he's torching my team, any chance I have the opportunity to watch Anthony Edwards play basketball, uh, is a treat. So Ant could go for 50, wouldn't be surprised at all. You could have DeMontis Sabonis have a big game against Rudy Gobert, wouldn't be surprised yeah. at all. De'Aaron Fox have a big game, wouldn't be surprised at all. Malik Monk, bring his revenge narrative for losing sixth man of the year to Nas Reed, come in, have a big game. Wouldn't be like, you just look at the matchups and how these two teams, look, T-Wolves absolutely should be favored. They absolutely should be looked at as the better team because they have earned that. But this is a game where truth be told, Ben, I would be surprised if it's not close. If one team runs away with it, I think that's the only thing that I wouldn't see coming. Yeah, no, I agree hundred percent. I it's a, it's a, a, like I said, it's a weird matchup. Like, like all those scenarios are completely plausible and you could go through last year. Fox had the big game in game one. Um, Ant had a big game in game two. And then I think Malik Monk went off in the third game after Ant, left at halftime. And, and so there was a 30 plus point score at all three of those games, which doesn't mm-hmm. always happen. And, um, and there's the, the big man matchup with Sabonis and cat and go bear and, and how tricky it is to guard some of these guards for the Kings that go nuts. And, and the other thing that killed the wolves in at least one of those games was rebounding. I know Sacramento is a really good rebounding team on both ends of the floor last year. And Minnesota was spotty on the defense on, well, really on both ends. They ended up okay. If you look at the season long ranking, but, um, but it was really hit and miss. Like they had these nights where they just could not rebound. And if they were short of big or whatever, um, and, and so that could come back and bite them against the Kings, especially in a, a game with more possessions, a faster paced game that could really kill them because they're so good in the half court defensively. But if they don't rebound the ball well on both ends, then there's higher variance, more chance for the Kings to score more points. So I, I'm really looking forward to it. And the Kings are still a matchup that I could see going either way. I could see every game between these two teams being close Mm -hmm. and it wouldn't shock me if somehow one team won all four, or I'm assuming they played four times last year. They only played three. Um, Or if it was, you know, like a, um, you know, split series, you know, it's, it's going to be really interesting. And and I see the Kings as one of those teams in that 
second tier in the West, like you talked about, that they could be the four or five seed or they could just miss the play in. Um, there's there's just such a wide swath of outcomes there in that range of the West. And so the Kings Wolves matchup, you know, tiebreaker is going to matter uh, potentially. Um, and so it, it's obviously just magnified being two teams of the Western Conference with how jumbled the West is going to be. The Kings and T-Wolves play each other four times. The first two are in Sacramento, both early on. If I'm not mistaken, I think one of them's an in-season tournament game, if, if I'm not mistaken, too. I think we're in the same group once again. Um, before we move on to the West, Ben, the last thing that I wanted to ask about this, too, is um, I, re- I have a memory of five or six seasons ago. Now, this was a different regime in Sacramento. Dave Yeager was still the head coach, and the whole identity of the Sacramento Kings was run the you-know-what out of the ball. Just run. Like, that's it. And they got off to a really strong start that season. And very early on in the year, the Kings hosted the Timberwolves. And I remember this game because Cat looked like he wanted to vomit. Like he just looked dead tired, exhausted to where he was asking to get subbed out of the game. And I don't use that as like a uh, bashing Cat. He wasn't in shape. No, that's just how much the Kings wanted to push the tempo. I say that to say, I view the start of the season as essential for a team like Sacramento. Because... I mean, it's not a, it's not an easy start. I know they open up at home, but five of their first seven games are on the road. Um, the Kings need to jump out to a strong start because I look at so many teams in the West and even some in the East, and I say, these are teams that are going to ramp up. And as they get to February, March, April, and the calendar starts to turn into playoff time, that's when they really start to hit their stride. So if you can jump on them early, that's going to be the goal. But then I look at the Timberwolves and I'm like, yeah, that this team should be an established or looked at as an established championship contender in the West. But it's not like they're an old veteran team like the Lakers or the Phoenix Suns, who maybe they're going to be weak early on. How do you expect the Timberwolves to come out and start next season? Are they going to come out with a chip on their shoulder, hungry uh, to build off of last season? Do you expect them to kind of be in ramp up mode? Like, do you think the Timberwolves are any more vulnerable early in the season as they would be midway through or later on in the season? It's a really interesting question. I think so. I, I did kind of a schedule unpack uh, on the show. It would have been last Friday following the uh, the release on Thursday. And just kind of like looking at the schedule based on what we think we know about all these teams that we're going to talk about here in a little bit, at least in the West, the Wolf schedule is fairly forgiving early on. They don't have a ton of back-to-backs. There's enough winnable games in there or or games they should be easily, uh, they, sh- they should be heavily favored. So I do think they'll get off to a good start because I also think there's this, um, I, I think there was this, this uh, not I think, I know, the, some of these guys said this publicly about, Hey, we wore down in the playoffs. Like we we've never done this before. You know, none of those guys had been out of the first round of the playoffs uh, besides Rudy and, and Conley. And nobody's gotten past the conference finals that's on the Wolves roster. And so there wasn't this, there was a lack of understanding for what it was going to take. And if you listen to them talk in the offseason, it's that classic, like we didn't quite make it, we're hungry now. Plus, you layer on top of it Ant's Olympics experience and, and the additional exposure he get he's been getting. And uh there's still this like the Timberwolves players as a group banded together to defend Rudy last year. You know, I don't want to turn this into a, what do we think about Rudy Gobert? Because that sure. anybody could do a whole podcast about that, but <laughs> sure. the NBA on, on TNT guys, the way they treated him. I mean, in the conference finals, the wolves refused to send anyone to their, to their set to talk about the game. They wouldn't go do an interview because of the way they were talking about Rudy Gobert and, and mm-hmm. just letting Draymond trash him. And, and there's this sense of like pulling together for Rudy because that's continued through the Olympics a little bit with how, he was, you know, women Yama played over him in the Olympics and all that stuff. So there's also this, like, it's the same group. Uh, the, the top eight rotation guys, seven of the eight are the same. Uh, they're a little bit of turnover in the McLaughlin, you know, the end of the roster, Monte Morris. Um, but the rotation is largely the same. Like you said, they're not super old. Obviously Conley's up there and Rudy's exiting his prime, Sure, but it's a mix of veterans and, and young players. So I think the most likely scenario is they get off to a really good start, mm. um, have a great record mid late December. The schedule gets a bit tougher and I could see them because of that youth element and the reliance on Rob Dillingham off the bench as a rookie, the reliance on Ant as your best player, who's still just 23 and has gotten worn down before. Maybe there's a bit of overconfidence. They hit a rough patch in the middle of the schedule and then finish strong. I think that's the most likely scenario. I do think they're a top three team in the West, but I think overall they're going to come out really strong to start the schedule. And that kind of mid season lull is what I would be most concerned about based on who's on the team and based on what this, how the schedule lays out. 
That's why we really need the Lakers to lose that first game. Because I, I feel like if the Timberwolves somehow lose to the Lakers that first game, they're going to be pissed off coming to Sacramento. I, was, I could that's, absolutely see that. I that's see the last Ant, thing the Kings need. Yeah, and having a bad game on national TV on the opener and being like, all right, I got to score 50. Like, that's totally how that could play out. Um, I think it's more likely than not both are really good games and, and mm. both are both are close games. Well, we'll be rooting for a 1-0 start for the Timberwolves coming into Sacramento. How about that? I'm, I'm sure with your schedule breakdown that you're aware of this, but just in case you're not and, and, and the listeners aren't, the Timberwolves actually travel the most miles of, of any team in the league. The Sacramento Kings are number three, but there's a 2,000-mile difference, almost a 2,500-mile uh, difference between these two teams. Now, ultimately... These guys travel in luxury, right? The jets or the, or the team planes, the food that they get on the planes. I've seen the menus. They're r- ridiculous. The hotels that they stay in, but still travel matters. And you've already talked about how the Timberwolves kind of ran out of gas and hit a little bit of a wall at the end of the season too. So teams are, are constantly figuring out how to limit the travel schedule, limit the practices as much as possible to keep teams as fresh as possible for deep runs into June and, and, and late June and hopefully into the NBA finals. Does the travel mean anything to you? I'll tell you, the only thing that bothers me about the travel is that I expect with the Sacramento Kings being on the West Coast and being literally on the coast that there's going to be a lot of travel. The Kings, Warriors, and Clippers are all like third, fourth, and fifth in most travel miles. Then you have the Lakers at 11th. So for some reason, the NBA can find a way for the Lakers not to travel a crap ton, but not for the other California teams. That's the only thing that really bothers me about the travel miles. But Minnesota being number one in traveling, does that does that matter or bother you at all? I think play a factor into the Wolves trying to handle the schedule of going deep into June. Grand scheme of things, no. I mean, it's it's not unusual. I believe they were number one last year. They've certainly been number one in recent, maybe sure. it's two years ago. Uh, they're usually up there just because they're in the middle of the country. It is still a little bit surprising because it's not like they're that far from Milwaukee and Chicago, but it's mm-hmm. because of the division. They're mm-hmm. playing the Northwest division. Everybody else besides OKC is actually in the Western time zone or at least mountain time zone. Whereas like you have, you know, Bulls, Bucks, Pistons, Pacers, those guys are all really close to each other. So because the Wolves division is so spread out, um, it's been one of those like, Wolves fans complain about it, you know, every year when the schedule comes out. Eventually, when the NBA expands, everyone's, you know, the Wolves are, Wolves fans are are signing us up, number one on the list to get moved to the Eastern Conference and have been since the Kevin Garnett days. And, and I'm yeah. sure that, I shouldn't say I'm sure, it feels like it's likely going to happen. And then the travel goes way down because you're talking mm-hmm. Milwaukee, Chicago, uh, you know, those cities that are much closer. So I think grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. There's a couple mixed in there where it's already a tough back to back anyway. Um, and it just makes it that much more difficult. Like I think there was a, like at, um, I don't know, at Denver at Minnesota, which you get occasionally cause they're in the same division going from altitude. Not that they're the only team that would do that. Um, but some of those were like, you play a West coast game and then you're coming back to Minnesota to play the next night that happens more often. Um, but grand scheme of things, I don't know. Everybody's got to travel. Like you laid out, you know, the, the, the way that they travel. Um, it may impact some of the guys like Rudy and, and Conley and the guys that can stiff it up. And, and there may be some more rest days mixed in there. The wolves didn't do a whole lot of that last year. Those guys pretty much played when they could play. Um, and maybe they learned some lessons, you know, Conley was pretty worn down in June. So, um, I, I think this year there's also a chance they bake in a few more rest days, especially given the travel schedule. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is sponsored by our friends at BetterHelp. What are your self-care non-negotiables? Maybe you never skip leg day or therapy day. Maybe that's what it should be. When your schedule is packed with your kids' activities, big work projects, or more than more beyond that even, it's easy to let your own priorities slip. Even when we know what makes us happy, it's sometimes just hard to make time for it, especially when you're worried about other people, whether it's kids or friends or family. Whatever it might be, you have to make time for yourself. If you feel like you have no time for yourself, Having non-negotiables like therapy can be more important than ever. Seriously, like how do you take care of other people if you haven't taken care of yourself and have yourself in a good mind frame? I I think that's super important to think about. Um, Therapy can do just that. It can help you get your priorities aligned. So in order to do that, make therapy itself a priority. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Never skip therapy day with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash NBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash NBA. 
The Kings have an Atlanta, Toronto back to back, by the way, in like the first couple weeks of the season. That's a cra- that's Stuff. crazy. Atlanta to Toronto. So it it happens to every team, right? Yeah. All right. Well, let's wrap up with this. Looking at the Western Conference, we already kind of talked about the tiers, right? The Minnesota Timberwolves definitely belong in that top tier. What I'm excited about for this year, Ben, from a consumer standpoint, it's going to be stressful as hell for us who follow these teams religiously. Every single game in the Western Conference has massive implications because honestly, the difference between the third seed and the seventh seed could be three or four games. Like that's not Mm -hmm. absurd to even consider the goal for the Sacramento Kings. In my opinion is, is reach that 50 win threshold because I think 50 wins secures you a playoff spot, but also the way the league is going, it wouldn't surprise me that half like half the playoff teams in the West are 50 win teams. It's just, that's just the state. Actually, that might've been the case last season that there were four or five 50 win teams. Uh, in the West last year. Yeah, there, so the were, West, there were five, yeah. Yeah, the West is just crazy, but it makes it exciting for us every single night. Like that Kings-Timberwolves game, the, the Kings uh, or Timberwolves-Lakers first game of the season could end up having significant tiebreaker implications. We have no idea. What is your read and Minnesota's read on the Western Conference, how competitive it is given the expectation not just in minnesota but around the league the expectation is no the timberwolves are one of the best like they they need to be up there the expectations are that they need to be up there the kings are trying to get there the timberwolves have to stay there that's not going to be an easy thing regardless of how talented your team is yeah and i think if you if you pulled you know uh I don't know, 100 nba uh followers or writers or whatever around the country right now most would say Three out of four, three out of the best four teams in the entire NBA are in the West with OKC, Mm -hmm. Denver, Minnesota, and then obviously Boston. Um, And depending on what you think about Dallas, obviously regular season, they were a fairly distant fifth seed, but of course went to the finals. Right. And of course added Clay Thompson. Um, So it's a, it's, it's tricky. I don't know. I mean, I think everybody, the consensus out there is OKC improved their team the most this offseason. I, I would agree with that. It's maybe not as, um, I maybe shouldn't be as unanimous as it is. Uh, and obviously Jokic isn't going anywhere, even if Denver's roster is a little weaker and they struggled at the end of the year last year. Um, so yeah, I, I think the expectation is certainly, I would just call it a top four seed because of like you laid out how tough the West is. You're right. We had, you know, five 50 win teams in the Western conference and seven teams had 49 or more wins last year, which is Crazy. just insane. And that includes the Pelicans at 49 wins with what they got out of Zion and could they get more? And, um, Obviously, that includes Memphis not having John Morant, and it includes yep. uh, the Spurs not trying to win a whole lot. And now you add Chris Paul to Wembenyama, and you add you know Stefan Castle, and so I think um, I think that the goal for the Wolves they won fifty six games last year. The over under win total at FanDuel is fifty two and a half. I would take the over. I think they they could easily win. I shouldn't say easily. They could win sixty games. That's yep. completely feasible. They could win 52 games. I'd be really surprised, barring significant injury, if it was under 52. Just with how tough the West is, you're going to have everybody kind of jumbled in that Mm. 48 to 58 wins. Whereas in the East, you're going to have the Celtics, maybe the Knicks, maybe the Sixers that are way up there, maybe the Bucks, and then you know everybody else spread out. So I think it's going to limit some of the higher win totals. But to your point, the tiebreakers are going to be crazy. And and I, I do think the Wolves are... I would say a solid top four. I would argue a top three team in the West, um, and I'd put them ahead of Denver right now um, if I were doing a ranking just behind OKC. Uh, and then Sacramento is in that tier with, I think I'd put them right in the middle of that, you know, Pelicans, Suns, um, Lakers, Warriors tier. Um, I don't. I wouldn't put anyone else there yet. Memphis could get there, mm-hmm. depending on how things shake out health wise for them. But and and like you said, that the the difference there isn't massive. Um, an injury here, an injury there, uh, and um, you know, things could change drastically. So every single game of the West, uh, is important. And you mentioned Portland being in a tier on their own at the bottom, like those games, you can't, you can't lose those games either because no. of how tough the West is. You have yeah. to beat Portland because you might go two and two against, you know, half the teams in the West. So yeah, yeah it's going to be a ton of fun. Yeah. The Kings know a thing or two about losing to Portland and Detroit and just for no reason, losing games like that. Something they have to clean up. Last thing, Ben is OKC is OKC the team that's most concerning to the Timberwolves in the West? I actually don't hate the matchup with OKC. They don't they don't scare Timberwolves fans a whole lot. Uh, I would say that they are the favorite in the West, and I understand why. I think SGA still is somehow a little bit underrated. Um, I think that 
it's going to depend on how Chet Holmgren and uh, and Hartenstein play together. Mm. Um, Hartenstein play together, but uh, I would say they're the favorite. I like how the Wolves match up with the Thunder. I think that they can. Their bigs are better than the Thunder's bigs. Um, I think that they can guard SJ. They've got multiple guys that can. And anytime those two teams play, it's got to be a Jalen Williams or somebody else, Lou Dort, somebody that steps up for them and produces. That's not one of their main guys because the Wolves can combat SGA. They can combat Chet um, and and they can do a pretty good job there. So I believe they split the four games last year. All were good. Um, I think it's going to be fun to watch OKC and Minnesota battle. They they play on New Year's Eve is the first time. And then mm. like three of four in like mid-February, three of four games are between those two teams. So it's going to be a weird um, you know, health is going to play a big, a big role when they play three out of four against OKC around the all-star break. So it's going to be a ton of fun. I, I like what OKC did. I think they made some great additions. Um, but in terms of matchups, I would still worry more like in a playoff series against the Denver, against the Dallas, um, you know, some of those other teams, even a team like Sacramento matchup wise scares me a little bit more, even if the Thunder have the higher end talent in terms of SGA and, and guys like that, but it's going to be a ton of fun in the West. I can't wait for this season. Can't wait to get it started. Of course, that includes October 24th. Ben, uh, you got everybody taken care of with all the Timberwolves news and coverage all season long, my man. Hopefully we can hit the fast forward button on life a little bit and get there sooner than later. But appreciate you making the time to come here on Locked on Kings. Good luck this season. I have a feeling this won't be the last time we talk. Maybe previewing a playoff series. I don't know. I'm just manifesting it. Maybe. It would be a fun series. I'd I'd be nervous about it, but I I wouldn't hate that. (laughs) Appreciate you having me, Matt. All right, there you have it. My conversation with Matt George of Locked On Kings. He does a great job over there covering Sacramento. Go check out our full conversation. I think he posted it Friday as well. Um, uh, Our full conversation about George McLaughlin. And then the rest of that show is what we just played here at Locked On Wolves. So go check that out on their feed. Um, And uh, I'll be back on Monday. We'll We'll be right back at it next week. Monday, Wednesday, Friday shows as we get near the end of August. And uh, drawing ever closer to media day and training camp and preseason and everything that comes along with it. We are officially in prediction season. We're there. All right. So we'll be back on Monday. A big thank you for making locked on wolves. Your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms, wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find locked on wolves. Of course, you can also watch on uh, YouTube as well as um, on the Amazon fire TV or Roku Uh, devices. You can find the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app and watch this show there. You can also follow on X at Lockdown T-Wolves and also at B-Beacon with two B's, two E's, C-K-E-N. Of course, the Lockdown Wolves podcast is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Remember, the Lockdown Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.